Greetings and salutations, everyone. My name is Age Kirkoff, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, we're talking about my must-start players for Week 9 of the 2022 Fantasy Football Season. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about five prospects who have risen in my rankings more than all others thus far this week. Players that, due to their current circumstance, are going to have an increased volume of opportunity and will be able to act upon said opportunity to help us capture a victory in Week 9. I know many of us are dealing with the bipocalypse as six teams are on by, but if, in fact, you have these players available to you on your roster or on the waivers, you can go ahead, pick them up, and play them this week and find immediate success with their overall opportunity. Now, before we begin and get into today's content, talking about these must-start prospects, of course, I want to remind you guys, tomorrow we'll be live streaming here on the channel from 1 to 3 p.m. PST. Again, answering starter sick questions. So if you've got any, be sure to join us. Also, we'll be live streaming Sunday morning, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, like we do every Sunday morning. Kick off with Kirikov with updated rankings at all four primary positions on screen. We'll have my top 36 running backs, wide receivers, top 16 quarterbacks and tight ends updated and on screen. So for those of you who need to set your lineups at the very last moment, We'll be here to help you guys out answering questions throughout the entirety of that two-hour session. So if you're trying to stay up to date on my latest content, be sure to subscribe down below. Again, we are on our way to 80,000 subscribers. We're making daily fantasy football content, not only to help you win your weekly matchups, but a 2022 fantasy football championship. So, of course, click that subscribe button. Thank you very much. Now, after we go ahead and talk about the five must-start players going into Week 9, we'll then transition and talk about some entries via Price Picks. Again, if you guys haven't checked them out, there's a link down in the description. I've got some spicy plays going into this upcoming weekend, picking more or less on a given player statistic. So go ahead click on that link and when you sign up today and make a first time deposit using promo code andrew you'll be giving a first time deposit match up to 100 dollars we'll go ahead and give you guys a lot of those picks later on in today's episode for those of you who just want to hear those you can go to the timestamps down in the description of the video and travel over there we got some really good ones going into this week uh that i absolutely will be making entries on and you should be doing so as well all right with all that covered let's get into talking about our must-start players for week nine beginning with our number one antonio gibson he is a player that thus far this week has risen in my rankings quite a lot I mean, right now on Yahoo formats, he's only being started in 51% of leagues. I think that number should be close to 90%, quite frankly, because I'm okay with 10% of people probably being inactive, but every league should be starting Antonio Gibson going into the week, and I'll tell you exactly why. Over the course of the last two weeks, as Taylor Heineke has taken the starting job for the Washington Commanders, we have seen the overall opportunity of receiving work out of the backfield increase a very large margin in comparison to when Carson Wentz was under center. Now, to give you some specifics, in week seven and eight, while Taylor Heineke has been the starting quarterback, he has thrown the ball 64 times, you know, pretty good yards, 480 yards, three passing touchdowns, no problem. But ultimately, two of those passing touchdowns have been to running backs and 20 of those total 64 passing attempts have been towards the running back position as well. That's 31.25% of his total passing attempts directed towards the running back position being Antonio Gibson, of course, Brian Robinson Jr., and J.D. McKissick. Those 20 overall targets have led to 15 receptions, 103 receiving yards, two receiving touchdowns, and 29.8 fantasy points in two games just off receiving statistics alone. Now, when I went back into the 2021 season and looked at the games in which Taylor Heineke was the starting quarterback for this team from weeks 2 through 13, he, he targeted the running back position a lot in those given games. I mean, 80 total targets for 75 receptions to the running back position throughout that 11-game span. That is incredible numbers. And though the target share wasn't as high as it currently is, it was at a 22% rate last season, 31% is pretty ridiculous. But if we're going to continue on that path, especially considering the circumstance of this backfield for Washington, I think there's a very good opportunity for Antonio Gibson to have another incredible play. And I'll tell you why. Mainly because J.D. McKissick is out this week. And with J.D. McKissick being one of the primary receiving backs for this team, that opens up so much more opportunity for Antonio Gibson to get back to his three-down role of not only getting himself rushing attempts on first and second down, but of course being the exclusive third down back for this team and getting himself a lot of opportunity not only in dump-off passes, but vertical routes that he can find success in. You got to remember, guys, this is a former college wide receiver. He had more receptions in college than he had rushing attempts. Antonio Gibson has hands, and he's absolutely going to be able to deliver for us, mainly because the Minnesota Vikings defense, they haven't really given up much on the ground, only allowing 3.85 yards per carry as of thus far this season, only giving up 531 rushing yards and five rushing touchdowns in the seven games that they have played. So yes, there's a potential for them to give up points on the ground, but it's not a guarantee. And that's not what I'm looking for. I'm expecting Antonio Gibson to get a lot of his utilization through the air over the course of the last two weeks. He's been able to average eight and a half rushing attempts for 39 rushing yards per game, 5.5 targets, five receptions per game, and 38 receiving yards per game, and one receiving touchdown per game, 16.2 half PPR fantasy points per game on average over the last two weeks. If he continues that streak, especially with more opportunity in the receiving game going in his direction, of course, a couple scattered rushing attempts here and there, we're in business to go ahead, start Antonio Gibson, and expect a lot of high upside going into the week. Moving on to Josh Palmer. Josh Palmer is maybe the only healthy player on this team, quite frankly. Just to put this in perspective, 
Keenan Allen's going to miss the game due to a hamstring. Mike Williams is going to miss the game due to an ankle. Donald Parham is going to miss the game due to a hamstring. DeAndre Carter is dealing with an illness. Austin Eckler is dealing with an abdomen injury, is expected to play, but still was limited throughout the entirety of this week's practices. That all being said, the only other wide receivers on this team are Michael Bandy, who has four career receptions to his name, and we have Jason Moore, who has six career receptions to his name. I mean, obviously, we're going to expect to see Austin Eckler probably get himself a couple of rece receptions here and there. A couple, when I say, he's probably like 10. We're going to see Gerald ever get a himself a lot of utilization within this offense. But then it's all Joshua Palmer, who as of right now is only being started in 43% of leagues on Yahoo, which is a surprise to me considering the fact that since week two, Josh Palmer has been a fantastic wide receiver, averaging 7.2 targets per game, 4.6 receptions, 47 receiving yards, only scored one touchdown in those five games, but 8.2 fantasy points. But when he's been given opportunity to where he can get four or more receptions in a singular game, he's been averaging 11.37 fantasy points per game. The last time Mike Williams missed a game for the organization was back in 2021, week 16. Joshua Palmer, like we know, plays 70% of his offensive snaps out wide. If we're going to go ahead and have him as the number one out wide receiver going up against the Atlanta Falcons, Again, we should expect success considering the last time this happened was against Houston in week 16 of 2021, and Josh Palmer put up 12.8 fantasy points, scored a touchdown in that game. But speaking of the Atlanta Falcons, let's talk about how advantageous this matchup is. The Atlanta Falcons, they give up the most points to opposing wide receivers thus far this season on average in a half PPR scoring format. In fact, they give up 38.5 fantasy points per week. Not only that, they've given up 128 receptions, 1,720 receiving yards, and 12 receiving touchdowns to opposing wide receivers. Just some of the incredible performances we've seen as of late. Of course, DJ Moore last week, 152 in a touchdown, while Terrace Marshall had 87 through the year. Tyler Boyd, 155 in a touchdown. Jamar Chase, 130 in two touchdowns within that game, all in the first half pretty much. T. Higgins, five catches, 93. We've even seen Brandon Ayuk, eight catches, 83, two touchdowns. Debo Samuel in that same game, seven catches for 79. There is so much potential for Josh Palmer to be the number one receiving option of this offense and absolutely go nuclear against the Atlanta Falcons secondary, who A.J. Terrell is going to be missing from for the second week in a row. A lot of opportunity here within the offense to have himself a blow-up game in week nine. Moving on, let's talk about Tyler Algier. Now, for majority of the last couple weeks, I have been hyping the return of Cordero Patterson because what we saw from Cordero Patterson from weeks one through four was incredible. Two games of over 100 yards, three games of a touchdown. Obviously, Cordero Patterson is highly anticipated return. May have to wait to an extent, and I'll explain to you why. Cordero Patterson is probably going to be active in this weekend's game against the Los Angeles Chargers. But my expectation is that they're going to continue to still utilize Tyler Algier at a pretty high rate, mainly because we have seen them do just exactly that, even when Cordero Patterson was healthy. You go back from weeks two through four, Tyler Algier still commanded 26 rushing attempts throughout that span of time, while Cordero Patterson had himself 36 rushing attempts. So still pretty good opportunity. And what we've seen over the last couple weeks going in the direction of Tyler Algier gives me confidence that he's not going anywhere. He's had three consecutive games of over 15 touches and back-to-back -to -back games of scoring a touchdown, producing 11.0 and 16.0 fantasy points. But not only that, going into week 10, the Atlanta Falcons have a quick week as they've got to turn around off of this game and play the Carolina Panthers on Thursday Night Football. This will be the second time that they play that defense within three weeks, and that's going to be a difficult challenge, which leads me to believe that if, in fact, Cordero Patterson isn't fully there yet and they want to kind of slowly but surely implement him into the offense, get him touches but not give him the entire workload, Tyler Algier is going to be an active part because you can't just bring a guy off the injured reserve, not fully conditioned to the capacity to where he can carry the ball 20 times and ask him to do so. Therefore, we're probably going to see a limited capacity of Cordero Patterson because not only is he going to have to play you know, on Sunday against the Chargers, he's going to have to play four days after that on Thursday night against the Carolina Panthers. So I'm expecting Tyler Algier, even though he's been relatively inconsistent in terms of getting himself high yardage games, you know, a 3.9 yard per carry average isn't the worst, but it's not great. We know that. But he's also had to deal with taking on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, San Francisco 49ers, Cincinnati Bengals, and Carolina Panthers over the course of the last four weeks without Cordero Patterson in the lineup. Now, one of the main reasons I, of course, wanted to suggest Tyler Algier, besides the ability to get himself touches, is the fact that they play against the Chargers. The Chargers thus far this season are giving up 6.06 .06 yards per carry on average to opposing running backs. They have given up the third most points to opposing running backs on a weekly basis in terms of rushing statistics alone being rushing stats and rushing touchdowns, giving up 18.73 fantasy points per game. They've given up 890 91 rushing yards and seven rushing touchdowns to opposing running backs on 147 carries and the most recent performances against them are all pretty much consisting of a touchdown and over 100 yards we saw kenneth walker 168 and two touchdowns nick chubb 134 two touchdowns damian pierce 131 in the touchdown and of course james robinson 100 in the touchdown 
Why not Tyler Algier in combination with Cordero Patterson, Caleb Huntley, still being able to run the ball in a run-first attack, going up against one of the worst run-stopping defenses in the league. Moving on to Robert Tunyon. Okay, so here's the thing about Robert Tunyon. Over the course of the last couple of days, I've opened up more and more to the potential of playing Robert Tunyon just purely off of touchdown upside and the ability to take advantage of said matchup. Over the course of his career, in the last three games against the Detroit Lions, which is of course their matchup this week, he has scored a touchdown in every single one of those last three games he's played against them. Of course, two of them being in 2020 and one of them in 2021, putting up stat lines of two catches for 25 and a touchdown, five catches for 36 and a touchdown, three catches for 52 and a touchdown. Obviously, pretty you know stable numbers, nothing crazy, but that's not really what we're asking for. We're not asking for a Dallas Goddard performance like last night. We just want a touchdown and a good semblance of 10 fantasy points to get us into the conversation of winning our Week 9 matchup. And the fact of the matter is, I believe we'll be able to achieve that. And the reason why is because of Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers, in the last 12 consecutive games against the Detroit Lions, where he's been healthy and hasn't left the game due to an injury earlier, or anything of that extent, in the last 12 consecutive games, he has been able to throw for two or more touchdowns in every single one of those contests. The fact that the Detroit Lions cannot stop the pass, the run, the tight end position, the wide receiver position, the running back, it does not matter. They can't stop anybody. All of that taken into account and the fact that, yes, the Detroit Lions offensively can score, but defensively can't stop a soul, leads me to believe that Robert Tunyon should be in a fantastic position to succeed, mainly because this defense has given up the third most fantasy points to opposing tight ends thus far this season on average, giving up 12.76 fantasy points per game. Not only that, they have given up 36 receptions, 413 receiving yards, and five receiving touchdowns in just seven games. The fact that Mike Kosicki's coming away with a touchdown last week of course, three catches, 38 and a touchdown. The Dallas Cowboys tight ends, eight catches, 61 and a touchdown. Hunter Henry, four catches for 54. Seahawks tight end, seven catches, 69, two touchdowns. Vikings tight ends, six catches, 79. Commanders tight ends, five catches, 52 and a touchdown. And Dallas got her all the way back in week one, was still able to put up three catches for 60 yards. I think there's a very base minimum of getting himself eight points, being a top 12 option. But if he's able to score that touchdown, he gets himself into that 14-point range where, quite frankly, he's probably a top-five tight end by the end of the given week. And I'm purely expecting that based on everything we have seen as of late. His target share has gone up, having himself 22 targets in the last three games, which is just slightly over seven targets per game, getting himself 18 receptions at 157 yards. Those numbers continue to trend in that direction. We're in a fantastic position with Robert Tunya. Moving on to the final option. I know many of you were expecting it as you saw the Colts logo. It's Deion Jackson who is going to be replacing Jonathan Taylor this week. Jonathan Taylor is obviously out due to the ankle injury. And now that they've traded Naeem Hines to the Buffalo Bills, Deion Jackson is going to be the number one prime time back for this team. That all being said, the last time we saw Deion Jackson pretty much given the starting role within this offense, you go back to week five versus Denver, where he was splitting with Naeem Hines. Of course, Naeem Hines went down with a concussion, but he took over the game for the rest of the way with Philip Lindsay. But in that contest, Deion Jackson, 13 carries, 62 yards, on the ground, four catches on four targets, 29 yards, 11.1 fantasy points. Okay, decent game there against the Denver Broncos defense. Then the following week, as the primetime main starter of this team, 12 carries for 42 yards and a touchdown, 10 targets, 10 catches, 79 receiving yards, and 23.1 half PPR fantasy points. Altogether, an incredible performance from him in the two games in where he's been given ample opportunity. So why not? Fire him up this week. He's going to be given ample opportunity because, quite frankly, outside of Zach Moss, who's just only joined the organization, or maybe a practice squad guy like Philip Lindsay coming up, we know Deion Jackson is the only active back that knows the entire playbook and that the coaching staff purely trusts. I believe, quite frankly, he's a guy that's in my top 20 rankings and has moved into that position mainly because of the absence of Jonathan Taylor and because the opportunity is going to be given to him. Now, unfortunately, it is a tougher matchup. New England hasn't given up very many points to opposing running backs, even though they're giving up 4.3 yards per carry on average this season. They haven't really given up many points as of late. The Jets running backs, 14 carries for 49 yards last week. The Browns running backs a couple weeks ago, 16 carries for 68. Of course, the Bears running backs ran through that defense as a whole. 30 carries between Montgomery and Khalil Herbert. That led to 132 rushing yards and a rushing touchdown, which obviously is the one shining light as of late. And hopefully, we could see something out of Sam Ellinger to get more utilization out of Deion Jackson through the receiving game so that the totals from his rushing game isn't the determining factor as to whether or not he finds success in this given week. Unfortunately, Sam Ellinger on the 23 passing attempts he had last week only targeted the running back position three times for two receptions and 29 yards. Now that was a closer game against the Washington Commanders, but this may be a game in which the New England Patriots are purely blowing out Sam Ellinger. And if he's going to have to be in the two minute drill for the entirety of that second half, he'll be throwing the ball a bunch, especially checking it down to Deion Jackson. All right, now with all that covered, these are my must-start players for week nine of the 2022 fantasy football season. Let's go ahead and transition, and let's talk about a couple entries via prize picks that you guys might want to be entering 
this weekend. All right, as you guys can see to the right of me, we are here via Price Picks. Again, if you guys want to check them out, go down to the description of the video, click on that link, travel to their website. If you're interested in joining and playing, go ahead and use promo code Andrew because when you use the promo code and make a first time deposit, you'll be giving a first time deposit match up to $100. Check that out today. Thank you very much. All right. So, via the potential more or less category regarding NFL players going into this upcoming weekend, because again, you could put in entries for, you know, potentially the NBA, uh, you know, college football, you know, the MLB if you like, but Obviously, we're talking about the NFL. The specific statistics that I've kind of looked into that I find are really advantageous for us this upcoming weekend begin in rushing yards. So let's go ahead and let's talk about some of these players that, quite frankly, I feel comfortable with. As you guys can see on screen, we have Aaron Jones here at 65 and a half rushing yards. I'm 100% going more on that number, and I'll tell you exactly why. Not only is he coming off of a massive week against the best run-stop defense in the National Football League against the Buffalo Bills, where he went for 143 rushing yards. I mean, prior to that game, the Buffalo Bills were only giving up three yards per carry on average, and Aaron Jones blew that out of the water. So not only is he coming off of a big performance, in four out of the last four games that he has played against the Detroit Lions defense in his career, he has easily surpassed this number, putting up 67, 69, 168, and 100. Overall numbers that are incredible. Not only that, in two out of the last three games he's played against the Detroit Lions, he has scored over 38 and a half half PPR fantasy points. We're expecting huge numbers from him this week. And quite frankly, there have been a lot of running backs that have succeeded at this capacity against the Detroit Lions defense this season. Pollard with 83 yards, Stevenson 161, Penny 151, Cook 96, and we had Sanders at 96. Unfortunately, Moser only had 64 yards last week, mainly because they were down 14 points early and couldn't run the ball for majority of that game. But other than that, I expect this team to mount a lead and run the ball with Aaron Jones finding a lot of success. Therefore, we're taking the more on that. Now, another player that I really liked was Khalil Herbert, as you guys can see him on screen, with 40.5 rushing yards. The reason why I have Khalil Herbert as one of my guys in my mind that I absolutely want to play is mainly because the number is so low. 40 and a half rushing yards easily is accomplishable to get 41 or more yards. And I'll tell you exactly why. In the last six games, he's been able to surpass that number five separate times, putting up 99, 62, 74, 77, and 157. Now, the game in which he put up 77 yards and 157 yards, both of those did not include David Montgomery. But most recently, we had 74, 62, and 99 with David Montgomery in the lineup. In fact, we've continued to see a gradual increase in opportunity for Khalil Herbert, despite the return of Montgomery. Specifically, in the last four games, from weeks five through eight, we've seen a gradual increase from four rushing attempts to seven to 12 to 16. Those numbers continue to grow. And quite frankly, I don't think it's stopping anytime soon. I believe Khalil Herbert easily surpasses this number. That's why I'm going more on that. The final player I wanted to mention in terms of rushing yards is Ramondre Stevenson. As you can see, middle of the screen right here, 64 and a half rushing yards. I'm absolutely going more on that. And you guys will begin to see, I'm picking more on all these players. I only want successful players. I do not want to predict, you know, potential failures. But either way, in terms of Ramondre Stevenson, this is a really known low number. And quite frankly, I expect it to increase over the next couple of days once they realize that Damien Harris is going to be limited. He is currently dealing with an illness. And he potentially could even be out. Even with that, if his illness potentially like kind of prevents him from being in the game more often because we already know that Ramondre Stevenson is a three down back and they don't want to utilize Damian Harris late in the game because quite frankly, he's not healthy. Then by all means, we're going to see more opportunity go in the direction of Ramondre Stevenson as they're obviously mounting a lead and running out the clock with him rest of the game against the Indianapolis Colts. In the last six games, he's been able to surpass this number five separate times, putting up 73, 66, 161, 76, and 71. I think this number is very easily accomplishable. And most recently, as of late, we've seen Derrick Henry run for 128 against his defense and the Jacksonville trio of running backs put up 197 yards on 25 carries. I think there's a very good chance that Ramondre Stevenson surpasses his number. Moving on, let's talk about receiving yards. We'll scroll all the way back to the top and click on receiving yards. So a couple of the players that I really like, first and foremost, is Gerald Everett. Gerald Everett, at this current moment in time, is probably one of the only receiving options outside of Eckler and Josh Palmer that are going to get consistent targets going into this upcoming weekend's game against the Atlanta Falcons. Now, the reason why I specifically like this number of 48 and a half receiving yards is because we've seen him accomplish it multiple times this year. 54, 71, 61, 63 in this last week that he played prior to the bye week. So now that you have Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Donald Parham all out, and we have DeAndre Carter dealing with an illness, could end up missing the game, and Austin Eckler dealing with an abdomen injury. All this mentioned when we were talking about Joshua Palmer. This should all lead to potentially more opportunities going in the direction via targets to Gerald Everett, and of course, the yardage racking up while he does so. Now, the other player that I wanted to mention is Jalen Waddle. I go after Jalen Waddle's number literally every week, and somehow, someway, he surpasses it. Because thus far this season, he has surpassed 68 and a half receiving yards in every single game with Tua. In the last five games that they have played together, he has put up 
more than that number every single time. And that's pretty much all I can ask for because he's giving me success in that category. In fact, when you just look at Tua with uh, Jalen Waddle over the course of their careers, the 15 games that they have played together, which neither of them left early with an injury, in nine out of the last 15 games, they've been able to surpass this number. Again, the fact that they've done it in 2022, five out of the five games that they've played together where Tua hasn't left with an injury, leads me to believe this is an automatic. Now, speaking of automatics, there's another player that I wanted to mention, and we'll probably jump into a couple of their stats. You know what? Let's go ahead. I'm going to scroll up here, and I'm going to specifically focus on Zach Ertz because Zach Ertz has himself so much opportunity this week. Okay, so as you guys can see, Zach Ertz has two specific plays, and I think both of these easily are on the more category, mainly because the matchup. He takes on the Seattle Seahawks defense, who thus far this season are giving up the second most points to opposing tight ends on a weekly basis. Not only that, they've given up the most receiving yards to opposing tight ends amongst all teams in the National Football League. They've given up 647 total in eight games. So when you go ahead and look at Zach Ertz and his potential for receiving yards going over 38 and a half, that is an extremely low number, considering in the last three games he's played against the Seattle Seahawks defense. While he's been on the Cardinals 2021 through 2022, he's put up 70, 84, and 88 receiving yards. Unbelievably an automatic play. That's why I've golden started on my sheet here. Now, another play, the other one in regards to fantasy points is even better. He's accomplished that number of 10 or more fantasy points in a full PPR scoring format in seven out of the last eight games this season. When you go ahead and just look at his numbers across the board, he's just going to easily put up 10 fantasy points, especially when we're considering he's going to easily get himself probably near 70 receiving yards, probably five plus receptions because of the matchup in itself. I know that the addition of DeAndre Hopkins has lowered his overall potential, but the matchup is far too advantageous for the coaching staff, to, and especially Kyler Murray, to ignore the potential that Zach Ertz has going into this upcoming weekend's matchup against a division rival like the Seattle Seahawks. Now, while we're still on the category of receiving yards, there was a couple more players that I wanted to kind of talk about. Of course, Cooper Cup currently at 86.5. I think that's an automatic more. Like, without a doubt in my mind, Cooper Cup could very easily surpass this, even though in the last two weeks he's only put up 79 and 80 receiving yards. We have to put into perspective that, you know, Price Picks is looking at those two numbers and thinking, okay, that's probably where he's going to be at. And we can kind of like straddle this number to kind of give people a 50 50 shot at it. I don't think it's a 50 50 shot. I think this is purely an automatic more because in the last four games of his career with Sean McVay, they have been able to dominate against this secondary. The receiving yard total of Cooper Cup in the last four games against Tampa Bay. 183, 96, 145, 121. It's one of the best matchups for a wide receiver against the secondary that I've seen in quite some time. And the fact of the matter is with Antoine Winfield out this week and Carlton Davis dealing with a hip injury and questionable to play and going to probably be a game time decision, that secondary is definitely going to be, you know, in a little bit of trouble. Obviously, they just lost their star pass rusher for the rest of the season. It's going to give, obviously, Matthew Stafford a little bit more time, which he definitely needs considering his offensive line play with Shaq Barrett being out. I think Cooper Cup easily surpasses this number. All right, let's close out with a couple more plays here. We're going to scroll back up to the top here, and we're going to talk about fantasy score. As of right now, Trevor Lawrence, 15 fantasy points. Easily is going to go more than that number, and I'll tell you why. Even though Trevor Lawrence wasn't able to surpass this number last week, he's been able to do it in two out of the last three games. Not only that, he takes on the Las Vegas Raiders, who have given up 230 passing yards and two touchdowns to every single opposing quarterback they have played this year. So let's talk about the fantasy points that opposing quarterbacks have put up against Las Vegas this season alone. 23, 25, 18, 26, 30, 18, 17. In my opinion, 15 fantasy points for Trevor Lawrence in a minus one per interception format, easily taking the more on that. We're going to go ahead and close out today with one of these stats that may be a little bit tricky, but let's talk about interceptions. You know what? I'm probably going to be wrong on this. Mac Jones, in the last seven games of his NFL career, whether it's in 2021, whether it's in the postseason, whether it's in the regular season, whether it's in 2022, he has thrown an interception in seven consecutive games. It is no joke. Every single game this season, he's done so. You go back to the Bills game in the playoffs, threw an interception. You go back to week 18 of the 2021 season against Miami, he threw an interception. That's seven consecutive games as the starter of this team where he's throwing picks. So why not? This week against the Indianapolis Colts, we have Stephon Gilmore back there, potentially putting in some good coverage. And if he's going to do so, Mac Jones may float a ball just a little bit higher than he should, throw a pick, and give us a great entry for this given week. That's pretty much going to cover it for me, guys. Of course, there's a lot of entries to you know mess around with via price picks. So go ahead and check them out today. Use promo code Andrew when you sign up. And when you make that first-time deposit, you'll be given that first-time deposit match up to $100. 
Check that out today. Link in the description. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Tomorrow, again, we'll be live streaming from 1 to 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time here on the channel. So be sure to subscribe. Be sure to click the like button. And be sure to click that bell notification button so that when I am live, you're notified. Also, Sunday morning, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, we'll be live streaming here on the channel. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And until next time, I'll see you guys. Peace.